Welcome to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where we go behind the scenes with your favorite thriller and mystery writers to find out what makes them tick. I'm your host, Alan Peterson. This episode, number 204, is going to be a little different. While I usually interview mystery and thriller authors, today I'm excited to welcome a special guest, Vanessa Cronin, who is a senior editor at Amazon Books, focusing on mystery and thriller books for Amazon.com. When you see those books tagged as editor's pick, Vanessa is one of the editors behind that. The editors over at Amazon.com recently published the best mystery and thriller series of 2024 so far. And I chatted with Vanessa about those books and series, the authors, as well as trends in mystery and thriller genres for the rest of the year and into 2025. Vanessa has had an incredible journey from Ireland to the United States, and over the past two decades, she has worked as a book buyer, a sales rep, Amazon bookstore curator, and now a senior editor at Amazon Books. With her extensive experience and passion for reading, Vanessa joined me on the uh, podcast to share her insights on the thriller genre and so much more. Uh, Before we dive into our conversation, though, I wanted to let you know about my new book release. It's a standalone psychological thriller, The Basement, which is currently ranking in several of Amazon's hot new releases uh, categories, uh, including psychological thriller and domestic thriller. So I'm really excited to see the uh, early success of The Basement. Uh, Really excited about that. Uh, It's on sale right now for just 99 cents, and it's free for Kindle Unlimited subscribers. So don't miss out this uh, gripping read. Uh, You can grab your copy at uh, Thrilling Read reads.com forward slash basement or you can just go to amazon and go uh, look for uh, the basement you know you'll find it there so thank you for your support i really appreciate that uh, so now let's get on uh, to today's interview with the amazing vanessa cronin uh welcome to the podcast thank you thanks for having me uh so uh, could you share a little bit about your background and your work as a senior editor over at amazon yeah i come from a big book family my uncle has a he's been a independent bookstore owner in ireland for 50 years but uh most recently i ended up working in publishing and sales at macmillan for like 13 or 14 years and from there made my way to amazon first in the bookstores and then as the mystery and thriller editor for the Amazon book review. Oh, wow. So that's awesome. So you've always been working in the book business. That's like a dream come true. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, it's always been about books. Yeah. And so just kind of curious, what, what initially drew you to the mystery and thriller genres? Was that, were you just assigned to that category or were you a, always a fan of that genre? I've been a fan for a long time. Um, I worked for a woman who is a huge mystery and thriller fan. And I confessed to her one day that I had never written him or I'd never read a, a mystery and thriller. I was um, a lit major and I had done my thesis on Jonathan Swift. So I was really into like, you know, 18th century and 17th century literature and stuff like that. And she gave me a boot camp list of books to read. And I remember um, there was... Uh, the first Jack Reacher novel, The Killing Floor, was on that list, along with like Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and a few other things. And once I got halfway through that list, I was like, oh, yeah, I <laughs> from now on, I may only read mysteries and thrillers. It was a great list. I wish I still had it. I just because I kept reading those and I really kind of skewed towards reading those um, when the editorial group was looking for a new editor, they were like, oh, you could do the mystery and thriller genre. So that's how I ended up in this birth, which I consider myself very lucky to have. Yeah, sounds like a dream job for us uh, mystery, uh, uh, thriller fans. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Aspects of, uh, of, uh, of your job of editing mystery and thriller books, do you find most challenging and most rewarding for you? I mean, on a really practical level, as a reviewer, just the sheer amount that's being published in the category, staying on top of everything, all the subgenres and what have you, um, that is, uh, that's the biggest thing. I always have at least, you know, 40 more books to read than I have time to read, but I gamely try and get through as many as possible. Um, and then on the um, rewarding side, I just love what's going on in mystery right now where I feel like there's just, it's just changing and growing and adapting. I feel like there's just so much going on in the category right now. It's not stagnant in any way. And I'm particularly thinking of things like, I love the fact that more um, BIPOC authors are writing in this space. Mystery has kind of traditionally been a little bit 
uh, short on authors of color, but that's changing. Um, I particularly love the trend of indigenous authors that have been publishing some amazing books in the last few years. Um, and I love that idea that there are like social issues like, you know, racism and ageism that are being tackled in this space, which I think is a great way to do it in many respects. You kind of get people where they're being entertained and you can kind of have these conversations in a really, really interesting way. So yeah, I think it's a, I think we're kind of going through another golden age of mysteries and thrillers right now. Yeah, I think it's always pretty cool. I think people sometimes don't think about that, but like uh, thrillers and, and sci-fi and stuff like that. I mean, they have always tackled the uh, social issues and in, in an entertaining way, but, uh, but you know, it's, I think that's always, always been kind of a, a cool uh, side effect of all this for people to get more exposed to other cultures. It's always been kind of fun uh, to do that as a reader. Yeah, absolutely. And even other, you know, historical events or historical POVs that you may not have been aware of, like reading the latest um Wanda Morris novel where it's all about like land grabs and property development and corruption and going all the way back to the Civil War. And it's fascinating. I mean, it's horrifying, but it's fascinating to kind of get that slice of history from, you know, a mystery. You know, mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, that's sort of like the Killers of the Flower Moon, those type of books like that or? Yeah, that and there was... um there was one that I was just reading that also dealt with property grabs and stuff like that. And the name, of course, is going to escape me now because I tried to talk about it and mention it, but uh, I'll come back to it. But yeah, I do think that there's uh, a lot going on in this space and there's a lot of, as I say, kind of history lessons going on that are really, really fascinating, particularly for me as somebody who was not born and raised in America. It's been a fascinating introduction to the culture at times. Um, and I think that can only be a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And especially uh, uh, on the other side of the pond for somebody you know grew up in the in, in America, it's always been fascinating to me to read books from Brit like British uh, authors, for example, like, you know, on, on, about Ireland and the Troubles and all that stuff. I'm like, well, so it's, it is a good, great way of learning about other things that you you don't know you didn't grow up with uh, through. Yeah. Being trained. <laughs> so true. Yeah, definitely. It's like a win win. Have, <laughs> have you read Say Nothing by Patrick Radden Keefe? No, I have to write that one. Oh down. my God, check that out. Um, it's basically categorized as true crime. It's about a woman who was kidnapped, disappeared, and her body wasn't found until decades later. Um, but in between those decades, between her abduction and her uh, discovery, the discovery of her body, um, he talks about how her family spent those years in Belfast in the middle of, you know, all of the um, sectarian violence that was going on, suspecting that their neighbors had a hand in their mother's disappearance. And it is just one of the most electrifying history lessons you will ever get. It's, I mean, it's, there are sections of it that are more exciting than any thriller I've ever read. I mean, he's an amazing writer and it's such a fascinating slice. If you're interested in the troubles at all, it's a great way to get a, a great, history lesson yeah definitely thank you I'll, I've, I've written that down i added to my to be read pile <laughs> <laughs> you uh the amazon editors uh published uh last month in june um we're, we're talking now here july 31st but uh you published the uh i'm gonna read the title so i don't get it wrong best mystery and thriller series of 2024 so far as chosen by the amazon editors so i'd like to talk a little bit about that there's like six books on there uh, could you share a little bit about how how this process works? Uh, do you all sit in a room and hash it out and, and, and <laughs> pull it down to six? Is it like the hunger, hunger Games? How does that process work? Yeah, we actually published two lists in Mystery. One was just the best standalone books of 2024 so far. And then we also did the best series uh, books of 2024 so far. And yeah, we are reading every month for best of the month, this program that we do. And it's kind of like Amazon staff picks. It's the editors reading everything that's coming out across all categories. And then we do a top 10 list and we also do category lists. I do the mystery and thriller one. And then twice a year, mid-year and at the end of the year, we sit back and take a look at all of our best of the month lists and try and come up with 
a list of the best of the year so far and the best of the year. And um, we do a top 20. And it's really fun because we read across category, even though we manage, we each are assigned a category, we can, we have the freedom to read across categories. And so we try and come together and go, what are the 20 best books so far? And we will argue and pitch and champion and rubbish and say, no, that's a category pick. That shouldn't be top 10 or top 20. Um, and it's great fun. <laughs> it's, it's, sort of, it's like a day at the races where you're trying to pick the winners. Um, and the whole idea is that, you know, our mandate as a team is how do we pick the books that will connect Amazon customers with their next great read. And so for the mystery section, as I say, I do the standalones and I also do series. And um, for me so far this year, uh, the Tana French, the second book in her um, Irish uh, series, um, The Searchers, what are they? Sorry, The Hunter was hands down one of the best books I read so far this year. And then the book that Don Winslow ended the City series on came in at number two. Um, and those books just wowed me. I mean, then they're so different is, is the hilarious part about it. Um, the Tana French novel, as you say, is set in a small Irish town where a former Chicago PD um, officer is coming looking for a quiet life. He's had, you know, he's a divorced with a uh, a grown daughter and he just wants a quiet life now and it turns out that the little town he moves to has more secrets and more shenanigans going on than almost Chicago um, and Tana French is just like a ma an amazing writer it's just so atmospheric it's not the kind of mystery you're going to come to if you're looking for car chases and stuff like that but if you're looking for superb character studies and um, a masterclass in atmospherics and suspense building. This is the book. And then the Don Winslow book is just that entire series. He, I interviewed him uh, last year and it was amazing because he was saying he had set himself this task. He said he felt he was undereducated. He wanted to set himself the task of reading the classics, the Greek classics. And as he's reading them, he's seeing comparisons and, and similarities with basically mob books. And so he's like, what if I wrote a series set in America about gangsters, but I use the tropes from Greek tragedy? And that's what he did. So if you have read any of those books, you will see mentioned there's a character that, you know, corresponds to Dido, to the uh, Jason and the Golden Fleece, to Agamemnon. There's all kinds of characters that pop up um, from Greek mythology, but they start out as what he calls leg breakers from Provincetown in New England. And it's just the best series. I was really bummed when I realized that this was going to be the last and I would never get to read these characters again. Oh, and how many books are in that series? Three. Three, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, it starts with City on Fire, and then City of Dreams, and then City in Ruins. Wow, what a that's a whole different level of coming up with an idea for a book like that. That is so cool. <laughs> I know, right? And it's executed so well that even though, you know, a lot of people may not have read all of the Greek classics and what have you, it doesn't, it won't impede your enjoyment one way or the other. You don't need to know all of that. But once you do know it, it just adds that extra level of, oh, wow, I see what he's doing. This is amazing. If I remember correctly, I'm not very good at like, that uh, Greek history, but it was it like a, they said Aristotle or Plato, one of those two actually like were like wrote the first thriller or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've read that too. And, you know, with, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, two uh, books that feature prominently uh, in the City series. He kind of, he doesn't slavishly follow those plots, but he kind of works the plots and the characters of both um, books into it, which makes it even more amazing and a, an even more delicate mix. But yeah, it's fascinating. It's so well done. And the film rights have been sold. So um, apparently... Um, that actor who played Elvis, Austin Butler, he is tipped to play Danny Ryan, the kind of the head leg breaker in uh, City on Fire. So that'll be interesting. And so then I was looking at some of the uh, the other books on your list. Some of the, of course, you know, the masters, Walter Mosley's on there. Um, mm -hmm. 
James Lee Burke. Can you t- talk a little bit about those two books? Yeah. Um, James Lee Burke first, Cleet, because I loved this book. He does this really clever thing where if you're familiar with the Dave Robichaux books, and there are tons of them, he does something different where he takes kind of like the sidekick character, Cleet, and makes him the center the the main protagonist of the book. And so not only do you get to learn more about Cleet and get to see, you know, the internal workings of his mind in this plot that's all about trafficking and just the worst evil, but Dave Robichaux ends up kind of writing shotgun with Cleet. So you get to see him and get to learn new aspects of him by viewing him through um, Cleet's point of view. And again, it's just a storytelling technique that just shows why James Lee Burke is such a master. It's just so well done, so fascinating. It's almost kind of got, you know, almost a tinge of an origin story because like you, you learn things about Dave that he might never give up on his own. Um, and I just loved it. And it starts out with... Uh, Cleet dropping his car off at the car wash and then you would think something so mundane how could it go wrong and then it absolutely does uh it's such a great book and then Walter Mosley um I love all of his series whether it's Easy Rollins or whether it's his new uh King series and this one is um another one where um Easy basically takes on a case, a woman with ties to his past. And it's almost like the nostalgia and the um, the nostalgia for the past that she represents blinds him to some dangers. And I love Mosley's that noirish take that he has on things, that kind of uh, bittersweet view of the past and of his present, the way he brings you know, racism into it and the way he doesn't, the way he just kind of lets it sit there and readers can figure it out for themselves. Um, Just another masterful uh, novel uh, in terms of storytelling and setting and plot. So enjoyable. Yeah, those are two two of my uh, favorite authors right there. Those Walter Mosley and James Lee Burke. So that's always exciting to read their books. Yeah, yeah. Nobody does dialogue like Walter Mosley. I just love his dialogue it's kind of no surprise why those movies have done so well with denzel washington and stuff it's just yeah yes. i could read he's one of those authors is that i will happily read his books again yeah. which is not very often you know yeah especially with so many books out it's hard to read another one again i could totally see oh yeah exactly i barely have time to read things for the first time but him i will read a second time for sure and I will say the other two books on your list, I'm not familiar with these authors, which is why I love these lists, because I discovered new authors. Can you tell us a little bit about The uh, um, Nest of Vipers and The Comfort of Ghosts? The Nest of Vipers is um, one of those authors I love, and I don't know if this has to do with like, you know, growing up in Ireland right next to England, but I absolutely love books set in India. I love Southeast Asian writers, and this is a great uh, mystery series set in India. It is um, one of those books where the location, the setting, the cultural um, mores, the cultural rules, the the differences between you know what's familiar to me and uh, how they live make it just a fascinating read. And then the mysteries are super interesting. And this one involves um, a visit from. The Prince of Wales, which is actually a historically accurate detail. The Prince of Wales did um, come to visit um, India during the time frame in the book. Um, but the author does this awesome job of um, kind of doing like a speculative take on it. Like, what if somebody had tried to kill him? How would that uh, conspiracy play out? And it's just, you know, I inhaled this in a sitting. It's such a good read. And it's set in the, it's not set in contemporary times, right? It's like the 1920s. No. Historical, yeah. It's a historical mystery, which makes it even more interesting because at the time, um, not only was India kind of working towards making its bid for freedom, but Indian women are also kind of going, well, the country is working towards freedom. Where does this leave us? And so there's a very interesting feminist angle to it um, about how we, Indian women are treated and how how much agency they have and how much agency they want. And so it works on so many levels. There's so much nuance and so much going on in this book. 
Oh, that's the the, the food I'd add that one on my list too. <laughs> <laughs> Do it's really good. Uh, what about the comfort of ghosts? Can you tell us about that one? That's another historical mystery, actually. I can realize I do love those. Um, so Maisie Dobbs is the name of the series and the name of the lead character. And The Comfort of Ghosts is actually uh, like the Don Winslow, the last book in the series. She's putting this series away. Um, and it is about the Maisie Dobbs, the first book in the series. We meet Maisie Dobbs as a very young girl about to start service in um, a really wealthy household. And she's so intelligent that they, the family basically adopt her, educate her. And she goes from being a housemaid to a nurse in the First World War. And then um, one of the friends of the family becomes her mentor. She becomes an amateur sleuth and takes over his investigation business after the First World War. And then when we meet her in The Comfort of Ghosts, she's now a middle-aged woman or closing in on it. Um, Second World War is just passed. um, And she is still the head of this um, investigation agency. Um, And she's just it again deals with social issues. She is, she's not one of those showy kind of Sherlock Holmes, you know, detective prodigy. She's just this really lovely, emotionally intelligent, helpful, kind woman who deals with a lot of the social issues that are happening in England because of the the wars. Um, And it's just a fascinating uh, story. Every book in this is better than the last in this series. Um, so you get that slice of history. You get that whole thing of how women fare over those decades in England. Um, you know, where when Maisie starts out, it's not cool to be a detective. It's not ladylike. There's a lot of suspicion. Um, by the time the Second World War is over, things have changed in certain ways, have remained the same in others. So you get this awesome mystery this totally cool character that you just want to be best friends with. And then, like I say, a really interesting history lesson as well. So this is one series that I'm really, really sad to know there isn't going to be any more. Oh, so that's, that, that's ending too. I like that, like uh, Winslow. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have such a, a pulse on the, on the, I don't know, of course, with, with your job and what you're, what you're seeing what are you seeing uh, i'm just kind of curious what kind of themes you think are are going to be popular for the rest of the year and in, in, in 2025 well one of the things we're seeing definitely is genre mashups are really really big i cannot remember a year where i have had so many conversations with the lit fic editor or the sci-fi editor going is this book a thriller or is it lit fic or is it sci-fi? Um, and I'm thinking of books like um, All the Colors of the Dark, which was one of our top five uh, best books of the year so far. Um, and that is a book, basically, on one hand, it's about a 30-year hunt for a serial killer. And on the other hand, it's about devotion and love and the different kinds of love and, you know, keeping the the fires alive and supporting friends in their hours of need and the the helpfulness of art in healing trauma. Um, so that book stands out. Um, the other one I would say is The God of the Woods by Liz Moore. And she released a straight up mystery, uh, The Long Bright River, a few years ago, which was phenomenal. Um, and The God of the Woods is um, out now. And that is a book that is... On one hand, about two missing children, um, in two children go missing in 1964 and another one, or 1963, and another one in 1975. But it's also about class and privilege and, you know, blue collar versus blue blood. And it's, you know, these are books that they, you can hand them to any mystery and thriller reader, but you could equally see them and they are being picked up by book clubs across the country because they have so many interesting themes. There's so much emotional heft to them beyond the, the mystery and thriller plot lines. And I think that's going to continue. I think uh, the other book, of course, that I should mention that fits that perfectly, in fact, it goes one step beyond, is The Ministry of Time, which is a spy thriller a time travel book, a, you know, speculative sci-fi book. It's, I mean, that one mixes about four or five different genres, a little bit of romance in there too. Uh, and I think that's going to continue. I think uh, 
that has been a trend that, as I say, really surfaced this year, and we're going to see more of that going forward. So kind of curious, are you going to have a list of for August? And if you are, is there like can you give us like a little sneak peek? <laughs> Um, Well, we don't release the list until August 1st. Um, But yeah, I one of the books that um, I've been reading is um, a fantastic um, horror title and a really short little book um, called Tiny Threads. And, you know, we were talking earlier about how the mystery space is dealing with, you know, social issues like racism and stuff like that. And this book, it's less than 250 pages, but it's about a Latina woman who goes to work for a famous fashion designer. And she has to do things like code switch. She has to figure out how to kind of, you know, hide the parts of her, um, what you may call it, ethnicity that she doesn't think are going to play well at work. And yet she's also in this new situation, finding her feet, hearing these strange noises, having these strange, we don't know if they're supernatural experiences or if it's her psyche that's kind of breaking down. Um, And it's just this fantastic mix of horror and, as I say, living as a Latina woman in a workplace. It's really, really fascinating so far. So that's one that I'm really excited about. So the other book that I loved for August was um, House of Glass by Sarah Pekinen. Um, and she is the author who co-wrote the, um, the Couple in Between. And House of Glass is her latest one. She's writing this one on her own. And it kind of reminded me of The Silent Patient in that there is a murder, we think, and um, a psychologist who's there to kind of advocate for a child who's living in the home where the murder occurred. And it's just one of those super nail-bitingly tense, you don't know what's going on at any point. Um, Is there a child in danger? Is the child actually the cause of the danger? Um, And I loved this one. I absolutely tore through it. I love books that have psychologists and stuff in them for some reason. And this one just uh, fit the bill. And then um, we were talking earlier about how there's a a lack of um, BIPOC authors historically in mystery. One of my other favorite August books was the Queen City Detective Agency. And that was the book that I was alluding to earlier. It is also about um, property development and corruption and land grabs and kind of redlining. Um, But it's the start of a new um, detective series, and it features an awesome detective, uh, a woman of color, Clem. And um, it's that great mix of history, mystery, and 1980s nostalgia, which you know, I being, I'm, I'll admit to being, uh, growing up in the eighties. So that kind of, that was a a boon for me. And it's really, really funny is the other thing. Um, and then the other book that I loved and that we're talking themes and trends here, um, after Oz is this, I won't say it's a retelling of the wizard of Oz because the wizard of Oz, it picks up after the wizard of Oz ended. And it's kind of like, um, a speculative, retread where it asks what if Dorothy Gale were accused of murdering a spinster at the end of The Wizard of Oz what if it wasn't a witch that she had killed in some you know parallel universe what if it was a spinster in this uh in this day and age or you know in her day and age um and it's so original and fresh and it's such a help to kind of know the characters and so much fun figuring out which characters correspond to the characters in the wizard of oz and just such an original idea that again i loved it and it fits into a trend where um there have been a lot of classics that have been reimagined i'm thinking of the murder of mr willoughby which um kind of asks the question what if um darcy and um eliza bennett had um which we call it a son who uh, was a sleuth and uh, solved murders. Um, And so, yeah, that's another trend that I really like this kind of fresh original take on classics. Oh yeah. That is awesome. That's really cool. It's so smart to think of that and and, and to write a book based on that. It's just so so awesome. (laughs) Yeah. It's so great because I mean, like with the Jane Austen book, she assembles basically all of the characters from all of the books 
and there's at least, I mean, like Emma and Knightley and uh, Marianne and her husband, the Colonel, they're all staying at this house, um, having a, a party and the Darcys and their teenage son and Willoughby gets murdered and boom, you know, the son, Dar- Jonathan Darcy, is solving the murder. And it's just so clever because you already feel like you already know the characters from reading Jane Austen. And this just puts them in new settings. And it's just so fun to see them interacting with one another, people from different books interacting with one another. It's so clever. Um, and it's a new series. And so I think there's three of them in series at this point. Um, and I highly recommend if you're a, an Austen fan of any stripe, you're going to love this series. And and mystery fans, I think, even if they don't love Jane Austen, will love this historical mystery. It's really, really clever. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, yeah, that's awesome. You've 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 really added to my to to read pile. So uh, sorry, but- not sorry. <laughs> They're all good. I promise. Well- Awesome. So thank you so much, Vanessa. And actually, you know, I'd love to have you back at the end of the year. We kind of go I was just going to say, yeah, we're going to be doing the Bodhi list in uh, November, the best of the year. So I would absolutely love. It's always fun to see which books remain on the list from the first half of the year through the second, which books move up, move down, uh, the new books that get added from the second half of the year. So, yeah, I would love to come back and talk about that. And for the uh, uh, listeners who want to uh, check out the uh, that list, on the uh, on Amazon, uh, where, where can they find it? And um, if you want to find those and all the rest of our lists, you just need to go to Amazon.com forward slash best books so far. That wraps up our conversation with Vanessa Cronin. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Remember to subscribe and rate Meet the Thriller Author on your favorite podcast platform. Your support helps us reach more thriller and mystery fans just like you. And don't forget to check out my latest psychological thriller, The Basement, available now on Amazon. It's currently on sale for just 99 cents and free for Kindle Unlimited subscribers. Grab your copy at thrillingreads.com forward slash basement. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep on reading.